by Dr. Bob Lyons, co-hosted uh, by Dynasty Software and Horticopia Professional. And we're going to be looking today at a balanced approach to using colorful native plants in the landscape. So a little bit of housekeeping before we do start. Uh, today's webinar is going to be recorded and once the webinar is over, uh, I will be posting it to the Dynascape website and we will definitely send out a link. So for everyone that uh, would like to review it again or didn't have a chance to stay for the whole thing uh, or didn't get a chance to see it live, we'll definitely be able to see the recording. Um, Dr. Lyons will also be sticking around for some questions and answers following the webinar. So we'll do roughly 15 minutes of Q&A uh, following the webinar. And there's a question box uh, down below in your control panel that you'll see the uh, Go to Webinar control panel. Post your questions there. And uh, at the end of the webinar, um, the, the highlighted questions uh, I'll then read out to uh, Dr. Lyons, and um, we'll try and get Tim to answer as many as he can uh, in the amount of time that we have. So today's webinar is brought to you uh, by a very unique partnership between Dynascape Software and Horticopia. Um, Dynascape and Horticopia partnered a number of years ago, and so actually within the software, uh, within Dynascape Design, uh, you can access the Horticopia database and choose from over 9,000 plants. You can select those plants by name uh, in full color images and cultural information. Search for plants by characteristic, bloom, or color, and build your own detailed plant material database for labeling. Uh, Horticopia is the most comprehensive online multimedia reference available for horticultural information. The collection of pictures, ease of access, and rich features found in the professional version ed edition will make Horticopia your standard and in interactive horticultural reference. So today our webinar is hosted um, and led by Dr. Bob Lyons. Uh, he's presently the program director for the Longwood Graduate Program in Public Horticulture and professor, professor of Landscape Horticulture at the University of Delaware. Uh, he's taught courses in herbaceous plant materials, their diversity, and use in the landscape while on the faculty of Virginia Tech, North Carolina State, and University of Delaware. He co-founded uh, and became the first director of the Virginia Tech Horticulture Gardens during his tenure uh, and became director of the J.C. Ralston Arboretum at North Carolina State uh, where he remained there through 2004. Uh, so he has quite uh, an experience with uh, landscape horticulture uh, and he has numerous awards including a fellow in the American Society for Horticultural Science, Outstanding Alumni Achievement Award from the University of Minnesota, a Wine Award for Undergraduate Teaching at Virginia Tech, a Chadwick Award from the American Nursery and Landscape Association, and Outstanding Educator Award from the American Society of Horticultural Science. So uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Lyons, uh, Horticopia, and Dynascape, I'd like to pass this over to Dr. Lyons so that uh, he can begin our webinar for us. You ready to go? I'm just switching it over to you now. Okay. <laughs> we good to go? Perfect. There we go. All right. Um, okay, good. All right, let me just back up here for one second here. I got Joe in the line. Um, I've got that Windows back up here. You've been made presenter, show my screen or not yet. What would you like me to do on you, that? You want to absolutely show your screen. All right. There we go. You guys seeing it okay? Mm, we're, oh, there we go. Yeah, we're seeing the edit view of your PowerPoint. And now you should, now. you should see the slide version now. We got it. You got it? Yes, sir. All right, ready to roll? We're ready. Okay, good. Uh, hey, thanks for having me do this uh, webinar. I uh, started to do a few of these things lately, and it's quite enjoyable for me, and I want to do a special Hello to, I'm sure, some people in the audience. Um, when I heard from Joe 
um, who this went out to, I suspect that I might know some of you because I've worked with groups like APLD and, um, oh, what's else, and, and Planet as well. So uh, I'm happy to have a chance to speak with you, although I can't see you, just know that um, I think of you guys. Uh, and, and I put this talk together uh, really because there's so much interest in native plants these days, but there's also a lot of you know, information, misinformation, and also different reality checks on uh, why we should use these, what we should look for, what's important, what's not important, all those things come together. And, you know, I'm kind of, I teach courses in this uh, area for herbaceous plants that's certainly a concern for us. So this talk uh, was put together really to address some of those questions and also because a very good friend of mine on faculty here at the University of Delaware is Dr. Doug Tallamy, and Doug's written a very popular book called Bringing Nature Home. I know probably a lot of people in the audience have, have a copy or read it, and uh, we've, asked, uh, we've spoken together, and Doug's a very big proponent of native plants, particularly for their impact for um, landscape um, ecology. Uh, but I, there are things that he and I don't agree on all the time, and, and so we had kind of a nice meeting of the minds and, and uh, put this talk together to kind of look at those aspects and know that there's lots of things to consider. So here we go with the balanced approach. Um, as we move through this, you know, the first question is why would one use native plants at all? And certainly the first, uh, the first bullet point would be a preference for a garden theme. And this has been around for some time. And there's always been native plant enthusiasts. Uh, I can remember in the 80s there was a bit of a rise in interest of native plant gardening. Um, kind of went down and now it's enjoying another renaissance of sorts. But people simply prefer um, native plants. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a great um, opportunity to build a garden or a garden space around natives. It's great. But another one is, is all about supporting wildlife. And as you can see here, the monarch butterfly is being featured here. And by using certain native plants, particularly for the monarchs and particularly for in the Asclepius family or the milkweed family, I mean, you're going to be supporting the growth, reproduction, and continued um, uh, kind of presence of things like the monarchs. And the monarchs really went through a tough year last year, as a lot of us know, uh, that there was kind of a lot of flags went up and said, you know, we've got a problem here. We're not seeing the counts that we usually see. So using certain plants that are food sources in particular, in this slide you can see the monarch caterpillar, which is the zebra stripes caterpillar off to the left, that's on a stem of the milkweed, and then the adult form, of course, that we're all familiar with on the right. And so you can build a whole garden around, and, and it's very popular these days to build gardens around certain species of insects and or animals. Uh, so that's another reason to do native plants as well. And then simply to complement other species and contribute to design objectives. So if you're in the business of putting a, a garden space together, a landscape space together, I mean, some of these are natural. What's the flowering time? Uh, is it, you know, is it a spring? Is it uh, summer? Is it late summer, fall? What's the sequence of bloom? You know, do you want to put species or cultivars together that kind of follow one another so there's always some color or some interest in the landscape? And then the duration, I mean, um, you've got to know if this plant has a flowering aspect of maybe a couple weeks, like a bearded iris, or it goes on for weeks and weeks and weeks, like maybe one of our black-eyed Susans does. So all those things contribute to design objectives, and native plants can certainly fill the bill when you're looking at them. And then certainly uh, kind of what this uh, particular talk has uh, a good emphasis on is contrib con the contribution of color. And arguably, that's why a lot of people are kind of putting their design together, putting their landscapes together. So they want to be really energized by color in the landscape. Uh, and so I, I thought, well, let's kind of look at it from a balanced perspective with some emphasis on color of native plants. And so within this framework, um, this is often a key concern when you're choosing uh, which plants to use in the landscape design. It, I know it is for me, and I have lots of friends in the business, and uh, a question we, in fact, Doug um, even asked me one time, he says, you know, give me some colorful native plants, which kind of led to the, sim the motivation for putting this talk together. So I think a little further about it, let's examine some of the common perceptions about color and native plants, and I've kind of put them together as what I call subtleties and brilliance. Uh, those that are kind of making their own statement in a very kind of uh, quiet kind of way, while others are very brilliant and loud. And, and we can find species and cultivars in those and brilliance in the native plant palette. It's, it's absolutely true. Um, but, but before we kind of go into that uh, exact uh, definition, um, I wanted to hit some of the truisms here because these are things that I've heard. I know you've probably heard this before. I mean, the first one is that Okay, native-based gardens are often considered more understated in color. And I can't tell you the number of times that I've heard this before, and I just wondered, is really, is this a fair assessment? Um, and, well, we can see why this stereotype exists. Uh, 
hydrangea arborescence, and one of our very, very neat native um, hydrangeas, it's a very subtle green and white presentation, the species. Now, we know that some cultivars are coming out with some colors, but the hydrangea arborescence as a species type, which is a great plant to use, um, as is, is very subtle with white and green. And then off to the right, you've got our native pachysander, which is a very understated but very functional plant. You can see it's green and kind of splashed with some silver on it, but not really loud, not really in your face at all. Um, the truism number two is, if we flip that coin over, it's non-natives are often stereotyped for bolder, louder colors. But, you know, is this a fair assessment? Wow, uh, I think it's fair enough to say that this truism didn't come about for, for no reason whatsoever, because you look at some of these non-natives off to the left, every plant in that box on the left, it's in a container in the landscape. There's not a single North American native plant in that. Uh, even what you might see is a little purple sambucus up in the left corner, that's a European type. And then the, uh, the flip side on the right is just a big wash of annuals, and none of those annuals are, um, are native to North America, but they're brilliant, and these are non-native roots. So, I mean, they're setting the stereotype really quite well, saying that non-natives are brilliant. But um, as sure as those statements above are justified with our examples, it's really possible to identify both brilliant natives and subtle non-natives for the garden and the landscape. And to kind of kind of take you into this world here, uh, let's look at some of those brilliant natives. I mean, these two are pretty common. I mean, it's, that's why it always surprises me when people ask me this question about brilliance and natives, because purple coneflower, or Echinacea purpurea, I mean, has been around as a favorite garden plant as a perennial for decades. I mean, you can even go back and look at cultivars that were selected uh, way back in the 50s. Uh, and so they've been around as a very popular plant. And then you got that great hibiscus mosheatus, which is one of our swamp hibiscus, big, bold. That flower is about eight to nine inches across in diameter. It's huge, and so it comes in brilliant reds and pinks and whites and bicolors, and, and there's lots of flowers on a plant. And so by all accounts, this thing is pretty brilliant. And, and some of the newer cultivars coming out today are even making it more so. Okay, but then when you look at the non-natives, you know, you're going to find some subtle things in there, too, and we've used them a lot. Pachysander terminalis, which is the Japanese pachysander, okay, but that's, a, that's been a staple. A lot of people are having concerns about this plant right now, but it's an ability to get out and about. So looking at something like our native pachysander is a good idea to consider. Hosta hybrids, for example. There's lots of hostas that are not flamboyant. They're not even heavily variegated, if at all. And you can see that this example of a hosta, it's just kind of your flat green, but it's very functional. It's performing well in the landscape, but this is a subtle non-native plant. And so that exists in there as well. So if we want to return to the value of color when considering native plant choices, we kind of want to see where can we get this color from. Once that you do have a lot of choices, and don't, don't worry, I'm going to go through a bunch of choices um, later on that specifically identify some really good native plants for color. But first I want to kind of categorize where you're going to find this from. Because I know uh, the audience is probably pretty skilled in this area of plants and plant selection, so I'm going to try and broaden this up for you. So the most obvious sources of color in any plant, particularly natives, are going to be first and foremost the flowers. We turn to the flowers all, virtually all the time right off the bat and say, okay, what type of flowers does this plant have and do they really kind of have that appeal? This is iris versa color. This is an outstanding, colorful native iris. Uh, it is, when I say native, it's native certainly to the northeast and the eastern seaboard. Uh, but this particular plant has these really nice blue, bluish purple, arguably purple flowers. Um, it does, however, have a short window of blooming, and it is temperature dependent. The warmer it is, the faster those flowers will go out of bloom, which is a fairly standard response. But these are great. I mean, and I always like to equate this uh, to like a stockbroker who's trying to sell you stock. If that stockbroker owns stock himself or herself and then tries to sell you some, well, I have a little bit more confidence in the sales pitch. Well, here I'm pitching it to you. I grow iris versa color, and it does outstanding for me. And this is a great plant for wetter areas. You know, a lot of our iris are very adaptable. Iris versa color can grow in drier sites, but also it prefers to be in a wetter site, but it makes the transition. And look at those colors. I mean, it's just really quite beautiful. I mean, think about it, blue, beautiful flowers. And then you kind of look at something like a Coreopsis, and this is a perennial species called tri uh, Tryptus, kind of that golden yellow, solid gold color with a center point, uh, usually a contrasting color. Um, Coreopsis as a group, and we'll talk about this later in the talk, are just super trendy right now. 
Tripterus hasn't really figured into that trendy group right now, and it's a solid by itself, but it's a great native, and when it flowers, we usually later in the summer, it's covered. I mean, it's an avalanche of these kind of yellow golden flowers. They're really quite lovely, really beautiful plant to, to use. You know, some of these are not really used that much. Tripterus isn't really used that much, and I think it's a great plant to be used. And I want to kind of backpedal a little bit and say, you know, sometimes you hear that one statement that, well, you know, native plants are more adapted to both the soil conditions of the area as well as whatever pests are around. Well, I think we know there are plenty of pests that will take advantage of a native plant just as well as they will of a non-native. And the one thing about the soil you've got to watch out for is it may be true that they are from that area, but if you have done any construction or roads or homes, that soil is no longer the native soil that those plants are used to. And you're going to have a hard time growing in those what have become really constructed soils now unless you amend them. And I just did this myself. I really brought in a lot of organic matter. I just built a new house. And so I really want to make sure my plants would do well, so I really amended the soil. I cannot overemphasize the value, particularly for native plants, uh, because the soil is just not the same. So we went over the flowers, and very quickly, of course. Uh, and then we want to kind of look at the uh, foliage as an opportunity to get some color in there. And there are some good choices out there. Uh, look at some of the natives. If you're not looking at Amsonia hubrichii, which is one of our native Amsonias uh, from the Midwest, you really need to consider this because while it is covered with at the tips of the branches like little blue icy blue flowers in the spring, its claim to fame is going to come in later in the in the fall when it, the entire plant kind of explodes into this deep golden color. It's lovely. It is beautiful. It's outstanding. I have seen municipalities now really plant dozens of these plants along kind of entryways into a city because in the fall it is just a guiding path of gold and it's stunning. And again, I've got this on my own property and I fully anticipate that effect and that impact. And here's where the foliage comes in as an important qualifier for color. Uh, to the right is a more subtle version of color. This is our native Hexostylus virginica. Um, that's kind of a green dappled with that silver. Really nice, really interesting foliage. And a little bit of a digression here, hexastylus, maybe you'll know this as acerum or acerum. Uh, we are under a, a full-on assault for plant names uh, recently. And wait till I get to some of our native, all the native and North American asterisks have changed names. Uh, hexastylus is, uh, acerum for North America has mostly changed to hexastylus. So be aware that we're going through major name changes right now as you kind of look around for your own plants that are useful. So to move on, and there's another uh, one of our natives that's super colorful, Roost Picinia tiger's eyes. This is our sumac. And as you can kind of look at this, I always get a chuckle out of this because maybe 25 years ago, our chartreuse anything would have been sent directly to the compost pile. <laughs> and now we're looking at chartreuse as a hot color. And people love it, and they like combining with it. And here's the plant that does it. But here's a plant also that comes with its own cautionary notes. I mean, it is a sumac. It suckers. And so this is going to start spreading out under the ground. So when I grow it, I grow it in an area that's bound on all four sides by hardscape. And that way I know that it's going to stay within its boundaries. And some people will put it into containers. And so the container edges, of course, will hold it tight. But do be aware of that. It's really important to kind of research the plant before you jump into it. But this is a great one. The foliage is absolutely outstanding. It's a stunning plant. People will ask what that is all the time. And then, of course, what do these things look like in combination? Can you use native plants? in larger masses, not just single species, but really now we're talking about combined garden spaces or combined landscape presentations. And so I've kind of put together a couple of examples. On the left is a combination of Rudbeckia and Helenium, and a couple of, oh, in the back is Jilpai weed. Those are all native plants. And this is up at Coastal Maine Botanic Garden, where I thought it was a great example of using the natives, arguably, that little white patch is one of the um, Mexican zinnias, so that's certainly North America. But um, but the real ones that are native to our continent, uh, to the 48 contiguous states, North America would be, um, and Canada, of course, would be up um, would be those Heleniums and the Rudbeckia. Rudbeckia, there's several species of great plants combined in super samples, so you can see here. And then off to the left, off to the right, rather. Uh, would be a great, really intriguing, different bed of native pitcher plants and associated swamp or very wet type loving plants. And talk about different, talk about unusual, talk about kind of getting some comments. 
this is it. Now you can see the walls that have been built out around because this is a type of a plant that needs it wet and soggy all the time around its roots or you run into trouble. But it's a great example of natives in combination that make sense, that make a statement that look great. Okay, so there's that combination element coming into play. And then finally, visual texture on this palette. Um, how can natives, in addition to that kind of color, give us the visual texture that basically is described as a fine or a bold in combination with their color? So if you think about it this way, in stereotypical terms, a fern is often considered a fine textured plant with its green fronds, and then a bold textured plant could be something like, with a, like a large leaf hosta could be a bold texture. So if you think in those terms, you'll know where I'm going with this. Uh, some examples would be, this is a wonderful one, Hapuncha phyacantha. It's extremely cold tolerant. Uh, one of our natives in the US. Um, there's another one, Hapuncha humafusa, which I don't have listed here, which comes right up into the north, no problem. Uh, the cool thing about these Hapunchas that are kind of uh, cold hardy, cold resistant, is that they seem to deflate in the winter time. They, get, they lose their moisture, the pads will flatten out and lie against the ground, and then come spring, they in, reinflate, if you will, by absorbing water and they get erect again. Then you'll see those golden flowers, beautiful ones, there are selections that are more orange, and then those will turn into the really nice rich red fruits that you'll see on the left side. So a lot of cool color in there, but that texture is with the spiny pads um, these are very functional plants. I mean, I kind of describe them if you've got an area that you really don't want people to be walking through, hey, put in the Apuncha. They're not going to go there. Uh, it's, it's pretty dramatic stuff. Um, and really cool. I think people really enjoy seeing this. They, they don't actually expect to see cactus quite often in plant landscapes, but I think it's well worth a look. And then you have this really bold um, native plant, which goes out certainly up into uh, full North America. Uh, both the U.S. and Canada, and this would be Ashram Canadense, which is our wild ginger, but this is the deciduous uh, species. And that's why um, the deciduous type has retained its ashram as its genus name, but the other types of uh, evergreen types have gone hexastylus. So they are related pretty closely, but this one goes down in the fall and then reemerges in the spring, really late winter. And the cool thing about ashram is that they have these little flowers that are really kind of tucked against the ground because they have this ant pollination mechanism going on. But it makes a great ground cover. It's a solid green. It's a very bold textured leaf. So very functional, very important for the landscape, a great plant to use for sure. Okay, now what I want to go through here now is kind of what I call notable natives for color. Again, to try and drive this, this kind of this point home that when you're thinking about natives, you can also think about color and put them into that balanced selection palette that you're coming up with. So always remember when you're choosing your natives, particularly with a color in mind, that you select for first and foremost site appropriateness. Is that plant going to grow in that site? Is it full sun? Is it shade? Is it wet? Is it dry? I mean, all those things come in. They should be instinctive for all of you guys when you're choosing plant materials. Then you'll get into the finer points like time of flowering. So is it a spring? Is it a summer? Is it a fall bloomer? As we went over this before, duration, is it, is it a couple weeks or is it a couple months? Is it a habit that spreads or is it one that's a really tame clump former? And longevity, some plants are annual, some plants last a single season, but others are incredibly long-lasting perennials that will be better and better every year. And then for some people, ease of cultivation. If you've got clients that you know, are not so good at this and they just want an easy uh, landscape solution, well, some of those natives that are easy to grow are perfect choices uh, for those landscape settings. And so here's some examples uh, that I've come up with that, that kind of just kind of open up the palette a little bit for you. I know you probably have some ideas of your own. But if we look at this one, that's first for adaptable with moisture preferences. I mean, these are plants here that really do like it moist, but they will grow in what I call kind of standard garden soil that's been amended with good compost. So our hibiscus species and cultivar, I cannot speak more highly of this plant. I grow it myself. It is wonderful. A big flowers, bold flowers. Um, the one on the top that you see, kind of the open petals, that's actually a different species. That's uh, hibiscus coccinius. And then beneath it with the solid petals overlapping, that's hibiscus moschatus, which you saw earlier in the presentation. Um, they're very similar with the, uh, with the difference that coccinius is a very tall growing plant that can easily reach 15 feet tall on very sturdy stems and then covered with those big pinwheel type flowers. And the uh, moschatus beneath it may not be as tall, but nonetheless, it still produces great big 
showy flowers. I mean, they're really, really cool. I mean, people will really be amazed by how big these are. And typically, those hibiscus will start blooming in late summer, and they'll go right into the fall. Interestingly, easy to grow from seed. These are perennials, unusually, that will grow and flower their first year from seed, which is always a bonus. But off to the right, you have two other darlings of the, um, of the native plant talent. That Lobelia cardinalis, the, the upper right, is that red cardinal flower. It's stunning. And it's not by, I mean, it's totally coincidence that three out of the four pictures on this slide have red flowers, but I just wanted to drive the point home that cardinal flower is outstanding. It likes moisture areas, but it will grow just fine in regular garden soils, and it likes a little protection. Then its blue cousin, Syphilitica, is right beneath it, and that will grow in very similar settings as well. And these two species are known to interbreed. And so you can get some surrounding plants that might have a more purple appearance to them. And that's kind of evidence that Syphilitica and Cardinalis have um, bred together to give you the offspring. They're very good when the conditions are right for self-sowing. So once you have a couple of Lobelia Cardinalis or Syphilitica, you'll have a lot more in subsequent years if the soil conditions are perfect for them. And, and oftentimes they are. Thinking woodlands, and what I want to say here, and in, in when I say woodlands, is sometimes um, I think it's better described as dry shade. Dry shade is very tough to deal with for plant selection, and we do have a bunch of natives that do perform exceptionally in that capacity. And a dry shade is where um, you've got usually deciduous forests, uh, oak, beeches, maples, uh, and they're providing a great deal of shade during the growing season, uh, and they have a really a good a leaf, letter, leaf uh, litter layer on the bottom. But what they also do is they are species of trees that will suck the moisture out of the surface of the soil with their feeder roots. So even after a really strong rainstorm, you're probably going to see um, it's very dry there because the trees have done a good job of, of, of really removing the moisture. So these plants on this slide can cope with that. Uh, Aquilicia canadensis are common combines, absolutely an easy, easy plant to grow. And if you want to start a plant to build your confidence, that's the plant to do it that Aquilegia canadensis are a common columbine. Beneath it, Lilium canadense, not, uh, not so easy as Aquilegia. It's a little bit more sophisticated in its cultivation, but this is a beautiful woodland lily. Unfortunately, um, a favorite of deer. And I don't want to digress too much, but deer have become a serious issue. And people think, oh, it's a native plant, so deer don't bother it. Well, what do you think they eat where they're growing? <laughs> they're eating native plants. In addition to non-natives, but, but natives, and they love lilies. And where there's an abundance of deer, where it's totally out of control, we don't find those lilies anymore, which is a real shame. So this is an aside note here. We really have another sidebar issue, which is how do we control deer population? But I will leave it at that because I know it's people, it's controversial for sure, but, but you should be thinking of it. And then a great plant, Retensia virginica, again, extremely hardy. This is our Virginia bluebells. Um, that real Carolina blue, I, I lived in North Carolina for some time, and this is a very close uh, color to University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, sorry, I'm Wolfpack. I worked at Wolfpack, so I like red and black, too, but, uh, but this is very cl uh, clued into the blue color. Uh, really a beautiful plant, but this is an ephemeral, and that means it'll come up and it'll flower quickly in the spring, and then by midsummer, all the foliage is gone and it's gone dormant. But in the right conditions, this is an excellent plant for woodland or dry shade. Uh, areas. A bit more challenging if you want to look at color and native plants that you can choose. The Spigelium aerolandica, the two on your left, a uh, wonderful plant, uniquely colored, unique shapes. People actually think this is non-native. Why do they say that? Oh, it's too colorful to be native. It drives me crazy when people say that because here's an exception to that uh, kind of stereotypical rule there. This is a beautiful plant with wonderful red and gold color on it. Spigelium aerolandica, excellent. Uh, then you get into the gentian. Gentians as a whole tend to be a little bit more challenging. They want very specific conditions, whether it's a really fast draining but humusy soil, uh, some protection from full sun, so a little bit of a sunny shady area. And once you get that, you'll be in good shape. They are usually our late flowering plants, so late summer into the fall. They'll survive frost, uh, but eventually they too will set their seed. And then beneath that is our common trillium, the very large flowered white. Um, that is grown uh, very commonly for lump, but some, for some people they may find it a little bit more challenging. But it's a super plant in the native category, and does bring up the thing: where do you get these things? Again, I, I hope I'm preaching to the choir in that you do not go out and, and wild dig these things. You find nurseries that are propagating them responsibly. So you want to make sure the nursery is not going out and collecting these things as well. As well, instead they're propagating them as they should. And if you want to think sun or sun and dry. 
well, we've got a palette here of choices that were really are excellent. The Gelardia, uh, great plant uh, that is, um, or in the, uh, I call it the blanket flower sometimes, grape native plant has lots of color in it. The Asclepius tuberosa, all time favorite. And here's a great plant for those monarchs. That's one of the plants in the, in the genus that the monarchs favor for food source. Then our Helianthus annuus, which is our common sunflower, people don't realize sometimes that that really is a native North American plant. Uh, and um, we actually uh, debate whether we're really seeing what the natives look like because that has been used by native populations for so long that and has escaped into the wild. We're not so sure as to what the original one was or not. Very curious. And then a blue stem on the bottom, Shizacrium scoparium. I love this picture because it's for the, any of the Midwest people in the audience because Midwesterners know what prairies are and they, they know what they look like and they know what to expect. Northeasterners, where I'm living right now, not so much. I mean, I did my master's and doctoral work in Minnesota, so I had a fair exposure to prairies. But in the, in the uh, Northeast, they don't get this. I mean, this is like, get rid of the grass already, it's a weed. But in the Midwest, this is a part of the prairie, and it's right there with a beautiful arbor and trellis and seating area. And I think it's very simple, it's very kind of minimalist, but it's very effective in, in using our native plants. It's a great plant to use. For sure. So these are sun, sun and dry. They like it dry. They like full sun. And then a couple other plants which I just want to really throw in here are the various eupatoriums or the, the Joe Pies. You can see one plant can go a long way. They're sizable. They're substantial. Over on the right are Mertibita, which is called our Mexican hat, uh, related to a lot of our, our uh, sun, sunflowers. And then a really cool plant in the lower right, which is Lonistra sempervirens, and this is our native honeysuckle, certainly as opposed to a Japanese, which has gotten totally out of control. But you also see the, the red, which is the standard color you'll see, and then there's the gold version cultivar, which is a selected cultivar thereof. Um, these are all great for kind of that um, native habitat. And so once I've gotten past the kind of that broad selection or broad palette there, I wanted to expose you guys to what I call the fast trackers. These are native plants which have really been picked up quickly, and we're starting to see some selection going on in development and making them available to the public. So uh, these natives have received an abundance of attention, uh, and uh, what I say here is welcome to the asters and the new echinacea and hookera species and cultivars. Asters, of course, being a familiar name. Uh, echinacea would be purple cone flowers, and then hookeras. Uh, they would be oh, some of the coral bells that are out there. So let's kind of move and take a look at these. The asters, I do not want you to kill the messenger who is me, but the taxonomy and nomenclature of all the North American aster species has been revised, and the new names will drive you crazy. I've listed some of a few examples we'll go over in a minute, but you know I'm running out of brain cells to, to learn these new names, but I'm trying. But if they keep doing this, it's going to be very stressful. Fortunately, these plants remain, as they've always been, great candidates for adding color to the garden, and for asters, particularly late season color, which is so true. Uh, here's a couple good ones good here. Now, underneath each picture, you'll see the old name. Like on the left, it's Aster Labus. On the top, it is Cynthia Tricon Labe Bluebird. And then on the right, it's Aster Concolor, and the new name is Cynthia Tricon Concolor. Okay, I'm groaning right along with you on this but we have to get with the program. These are the new names. But regardless, asters often come in shades of blue, pinks, white, really nice uh, color palette to be using. And they come in both short varieties and tall. This is one of our shorter ones, Cynthia trichum oblongifolium, the old name being Aster oblongifolius, a tight kind of matted, tons of flower buds on it, really nice looking native plant for the landscape. And this is just kind of a Cynthia trichum lady, which you've seen already in kind of these meadow settings. And meadows that impart a really nice kind of free form. I love these things, by the way. I think when you reestablish a meadow or a prairie, um, as a, it has its really own set of, uh, it's beautiful in its own right. Really, really enjoy these. Echinacea, I know I'm looking at my time, uh, but I'm gonna try and get through this. Nonetheless, um, Echinacea, the two species, the straight species, Echinacea purpurea, uh, which is the purple one, and its uh, cultivars have long been garden favorites and continues to do so today. But a while ago, that yellow one at the base of the slide is Echinacea paradoxa. And that, when those two plants, when those two species were bred together, and they threw in a little bit of Echinacea tennesseensis in there, all hell broke loose. Because now all these new colors and habits of Echinacea really hit the market. Now they did go through a period of adjustment there. I think many of us know that the first ones that hit the market were probably released prematurely. If you were burned by that, 
come back because the newer ones that are on the market have really adjusted for that and are now fully tested and released onto the market. In fact, Mount Cuba Center, as I sh sh say at the bottom of the slide, is a nearby DuPont estate that is very much into native plants and testing native plants for garden performance. And so this uh, is a, a slide that actually was up there Echinacea hybrid trials a couple of years ago, and they will actually produce wonderful data sheets. At the end of this talk, it gives you a website. They're free, they're colorful, they're really helpful. Uh, so that kind of is an example of that. But um, it continues today with hybridization. You can see kind of the various colors on the left and that kind of uh, the yellow of the paradoxa, but a bit of an improved flower form with the droopy petals. Then you get into the big sky series with sunrise and sundown. Be careful here about trademarks and cultivars. That's kind of mucking up the waters a little bit these days. Uh, trademarking is not a patent type. Um, it's simply a, a name. It's a trademark name that the breeders have decided to go with, but it still has a cultivar name as well. You could very well see them all. As we go through this, you'll see Picabella, Pixie Meadowbright, all still wonderful plants in their own right. But the one I want to point out is Fragrant Angel. For a long, long, long time, White Swan uh, was the really only white Echinacea preparated that we had, but it really had some green in it. Fragrant Angel is a very clean white Echinacea, and it really is fragrant. The early hybrids lost a lot of the fragrance, but Fragrant Angel restored it, and the flowers are big. They're probably three to four inches um, in diameter, and they do have that really nice kind of bronzy cone in the center with a lovely fragrance. Uh, then you get something like wacky, like coconut lime, which 25 years ago probably would have been um, in the reject pile, but now people love this stuff. Uh, not only the green color, but also the very wacky full, uh, flower forms that we see. And you can see that extended in Confections, Pink Double Delight with that flower form, and then the hot papaya with a real kind of wacky flower form, too. People really, really like these things. I think one of the coolest ones on the market now is Cheyenne. Uh, Cheyenne is one that's being touted as growing from seed, which I have done before, and having it flower the first year from seed. And to be fair, I got good flowering, but not 100% flowering the first year. I'm now looking at second year right now, and it's a great 100% flowering on the second year for sure. Totally perennial, totally good, no problem there whatsoever. Okay, so Cheyenne's a great one. Then we get into the next group, uh, which is now Hookera velosa. And um, Hooker of Velosa also, um, there's another species, Macrorhiza, it's often confused between the two, so be careful about those names. Uh, relatively recent breeding efforts with this species have really produced great garden cultivars for the eastern U.S. gardens. Now, you can grow them on the west coast, you can grow them in Canada, but the one reason, reason why Velosa hybrids have gotten so good out here is because Velosa is a local native, and it does perform well in our, our region, whereas we would have trouble sometimes where the species parents of the hookah hybrids were coming from the Pacific Northwest or from the Southwest, and that kind of posed problems for us in our very humid, um, hot summer season that we have. But that being said, they can be used in a variety. I, for example, saw these in California as recently as last week being used very effectively. Um, the species is a tough performer. It thrives in deciduous shade. Again, that deciduous shade, dry, shady areas, but it can take sun as well. I do prefer the hookers with a little bit of broken shade rather than full sun. My personal opinion, I think they do better that way. It has good drought resistance, good pest resistance, and I say, and others say that deer resistant. I have not had any problem with deer eating mine. I do live in deer country. Uh, but again, like any time I dare say that it's resistant to deer, somebody raises their hand and says, oh, no, but they ate mine. And okay, how can I doubt that? So just be careful about that. And this is notable in its own right. This is Hooker Velosa Autumn Bride. You can see the example of the flowers. This is the one that has probably the most notable flowers of all those Velosa hybrids. Uh, blooms very late in the season, late summer, fall, really more, more like fall that you're going to see this plant. Um, with good solid fuzzy green leaves, good statement in the landscape, and great for dry shade. This is picture you're looking at right now is actually the base of a very large oak tree on campus here. And here's some more of the examples of some of the color versions. And this is a group, by the way, which really has been exploited for its foliage color, not so much for its flowers. So when you're looking at the Velosa hybrids, you're looking at lots of different foliage colors. You can see citronelle. Caramel is my favorite. I grow, I've grown, grown a bunch of them, and caramel has performed hands down the best of all of them. So when I started to re-landscape my own uh, home after I rebuilt it, uh, it, um, it, I tried a bunch, and caramel really was the star, really did exceptionally well. So I'm a big fan of that particular cultivar. You can see it at the base of the plant, and you can see it along the, the edge of the brick walk there. It's very functional, uh, very effective, very, very pest-free. Pest -free. 
and to kind of wrap things up here, I wanted to kind of go over some personal thoughts on making some smart plan choices, making those balanced choices, looking at colors, looking at other things. And the first thing is learn from the experience and knowledge of others. And in that regard, I do like to highlight Doug's book, which is Bringing Nature Home. Doug's right upstairs from me. He's in the, he's in the other department at, at the top of the building. I'm one floor down from him, and we talk a lot. Um, but he gets some great ideas uh, for trying to get the native component much more into your, into your uh, palette of plants that you selected. Uh, but it doesn't have to be all native. Um, and I probably take much more of that route than he does. But I'm still thinking that we should look at it very balanced in a balanced way. And do know that, you know, um, it, the invasive plants are certainly a problem out there, but uh, there are adaptations going on right now. Here's a paper, for example, where it says invasive plants can create positive ecological change for some of the native bird species. So who would have thought that uh, we're starting to see some of that happen? I mean, look, nature, it evolves, it adapts, it changes. And so if, if an invasive plant has come in, and certainly if that has had damage on some of these other plants and maybe on some of the other animal species, other animal species are capitalizing on it. And that's pretty much all I'll say on that. But keep your mind open, look at what's out there, make those choices, okay? Uh, recognize and react, which means if you see a plant that's really getting out of control, it's a non-native, then by all means, get it out of there. And don't save it just because it looks beautiful. Um, I think you're all smart enough to know when a plant's running into trouble. Consider cultivar derivatives with desirable characteristics. We're seeing more selections. And by the way, cultivars are not necessarily hybrids. Cultivars can also be selections. If you just sow out the seed from a plant, you're going to see natural variability, and you want to pick through that. That's what a cult, you name it as a cultivar. That would be a derivative that's out there with, char, uh, with desirable characteristics. Um, garden with good common sense. Uh, I can't overemphasize that enough. If it looks wrong, if it sounds wrong, then it's probably wrong. You've got a great experience behind you. Um, smart plant choices in my book mean just because it's non-native doesn't mean it's invasive. And this is where I kind of bring to the attention of our audience, native's only person, nothing wrong with that, um, but uh, your vegetable garden is not native. And so you need to start uh, dismantling it and moving it on. And I say that, of course, with tongue in cheek, but it is true. Uh, those are not native materials. So I'd like to see the same uh, judgment call for ornamentals as well as for our vegetable areas to be uh, very fair about it. That's why I approach this with a very balanced perspective. And just because it's native doesn't mean it's not invasive to the garden. And um, I know that there's kind of semantics that go on here. Sometimes they don't, sometimes people don't want to use the word invasive for native, but I do because that's the definition of the word. I'm personally not a big fan of some of these ornamental natives like some of the passifloras. Um, Teridium aculinum is our bracken fern, solidago is some of our um, goldenrods, uh, phyphostegia, conoclinium, oh, by the way, is the new eucatorium. So Joe Pye is being shifted around. You can see the synonym there. So in any event, um, keep those things in mind as you're making your plant choices. So go out and discover the colors, make your choices right. I've got the, the website right there if you want to go get the um, uh, go get the fact sheets that are coming out of the real good trials, and they do a lot of different trials, not just hooker trials and not just um, our purple uh, co-flower trials. There's a bunch of them out there, so I think it would be good. So it's been a lot of fun uh, doing this with you guys, and I think uh, Joe has got questions. Um, Bob, we have uh, we have one question, and if anyone uh, does have a question for uh, Dr. Bob Lyons, uh, definitely type that in the um, question box and uh, we'll try to address them but uh, a question that popped up early um, from Lisa Messini she was asking what zone of natives um, were you covering uh, this is a pretty wide zone here um, I mean just because I'm in the Delaware Pennsylvania area I didn't stick to that uh, that region at all but I think if it's going to favor anything it's going to favor let's say so oh, eastern US all the way to the Rockies and then up into Canada and certainly then down um, into, oh, stretching into some of our Gulf Coast states. So it's a wide spectrum. I could go back and, and look at any of these and say, yep, you, you could probably, if it's not specifically native to that provenance, it's still going to be a plant that will grow there for you. Great. And um, Diane Squire uh, just asked a question. She's asking, uh, in source for natives, um, a list, for example, for California. That's a really good question. California is really on top of this. Uh, what I would suggest that you do, and I was just out there last week, is go to the um, University of California at Davis Arboretum 
It's one of the best arboreta in the country and is a very strong native focus for California natives. And my guess is that they would probably have such a list for you ready, prepared. You can even try their website, UC Davis Arboretum, um, or certainly go, Kathleen Salkolowski is the director there, and that's what they exist for. They are there to help people out with those choices. California, and I don't have to tell California that you are in a little bit of your own world out there for plant choices. Great, and um, so someone's asking, uh, what are the disadvantages of selecting non-native plants? Uh, the disadvantages of non-natives are they too can, can succumb to your conditions which are not right for them. Uh, a plant that maybe requires a cooler temperature than the summer is going to provide. So in the east here, um, we definitely have some plants that will uh, require that the temperatures go maybe lower into the 70s, maybe the high 60s, but that doesn't happen in the east. And as a result, the plant can kind of like fizzle out, and sometimes we use the term melt away. That's one problem. Of course, the another problem is, I mean, I'll bring it back to the table, is is that plant going to be invasive or not? We always have to be diligent about that. Go to the sources of information through your state the university systems and to books and other people out there to check that out. And also, um, Check out to see if this thing is a prolific seed producer because it might be that while it may not last as a plant uh, over the winter time, it may drop viable seed and then the seed will germinate next year. A great example of that, which I hate this plant, is Japanese stilt grass. Uh, that annoying little plant is an annual and it drops seeds. And the same thing with garlic mustard. Most of that is going to be through seed propagation and so that's a problem with those. So you have to watch out for those um, performance issues as well as the spreading. Great. Um, Ralph is asking, is there a reference for duration of bloom um, with the natives that you were speaking of? Oh boy. Um, Ralph, it's a book waiting for you to publish. <laughs> <laughs> um, not to my knowledge. Uh, I think the best uh, the best way to get that information is within your own state or even sometimes communities, there is a native plant society. I mean, I've lived in um, Minnesota, Virginia, North Carolina, and now Pennsylvania and Delaware. Every one of those states has a native plant society, and those people are really, really energetic about natives, and you can be sure that they have figured out that information from their own personal experience, which you cannot beat. Um, it's, it's great to know people that have grown it and recorded it and are confident. Great. Um, so we'll do uh, two more, and uh, we had a whole bunch just pop up, but uh, I'm not sure we're going to have time to get to them all. Um, so there are some that argue that uh, native cultivars um, or nativars are, are not really native. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Wonderful question. Uh, and let me pose it. I, I'm of the camp that believes that they are still native because what else would they be uh, because they're coming from two native species or native uh, plants themselves. Uh, and so um, the one point that to look at is um, they uh, they naturally, many plants naturally, natives naturally hybridize in the wild. So I just showed you those two lobelias, lobelia syphilitica and carnal. They will naturally hybridize. So would you then call the hybrids of that hybridization not native if I then took the pollen from one and put it on the stigma of the other, where the same thing that happens in nature. So I kind of offer that up as one thing. And the other thing is that people are concerned about these cultivars not having the same um, impact for the native populations of insects and animals. The, the, point, the real fact of this is, and Doug, Doug Talmy and I have talked about this, there's no good extensive research yet that will prove or disprove that. So the jury's still out on whether um, a native pollinator, for example, will avoid a hybrid and then go to the, the straight species. So it's a great question. It still has a jury out on it, though. Great, and so we'll do um, one more. So th this particular question from Lisa Bain, uh, do you have favorite woody plants that you use in your own garden aside from Annabelle and Ruth that you've already mentioned? <laughs> Thanks so much for that question. I mean, you're going to the heart. My expertise is in herbaceous plants, okay? I still love the woodies, but I could claim that my expertise is not as good in the woodies as it is in the herbaceous, but I do have some favorites. Um, I, I love, and people, some people will cringe on this one, I love sweet gum. 
okay? Uh, liquid Ambar, Sturus Lipua, is a wonderful plant. I love the color of the fall color. I don't mind the gumballs at all. Uh, I know some people hate those things, but I'm a huge fan of them. I love the woody plant Viburnum nudum, uh, which is, I think, called Possum Haw Viburnum, which has wonderful, really deep purple fruits in the fall. Winter Terror is a selection that has kind of more ruby red uh, fruits on it, a really super shrub that uh, makes a great uh, contribution to the landscape. And I love Ilex reticulata, the um, deciduous hollies. Uh, those are terrific. I mean, when those things are in fruit and they drop their leaves going through the wintertime, and talk about a wonderful food source for, um, for birds and for other animals, that's it. So I love that. And let me see if I can think of another one. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of the deciduous conifers. And so your taxodium, your metasequoias, your glyptostrobus. Um, I actually, on my own property at home, have what I call the uh, deciduous conifer grove. Uh, and I've got all the genera except for larynx, so I'm, I'm still waiting to plant that in. But I guess you could say those are some of my favorites. Great. And I have one more because I think it actually sparks a bit of a uh, debate from Trevor Kimball. Um, do you think the latest resurgence of interest in native plants is a fad that will eventually die down, or are we seeing a change in the way we design gardens overall? Great question. I think like all kind of rises in popularity, you know, it's going to peak at some point. Um, and at that point, I don't think it can sustain that level of popularity, but I do believe it will retain a significantly better level of popularity than it started from. Um, and I mean, the reason I say that is because now I've been in the business for about 33 years and I've seen some of those trends kind of uh, ebb and flow. Uh, and so I do believe that we're really here, and I think that's great. Um, I think it is a brand, it's not a brand new, but it's a new way of presenting designs. It's a new way of incorporating new plants into the landscape. It, it probably this, this time around, it's probably best engaged the accessory reasons for having a native plant garden. That is the impact on the, the animal population, that including insects um, uh, and pollinators for that reason. Um, they go hand in hand with this. And so I think given that, and I'll, I'll put a plug in for what I do is for a living now, and that is that uh, Botanic Gardens and Arboretum more and more now are putting in either more natives in their ornamental displays, or they're putting in native plant gardens, or they're putting in pollinator gardens. And so when you've got that motivation coming in, I don't think it's going to drop out of sight. I think it's going to retain, I mean, it'll drop some, but I think it'll retain its popularity. Great. Those are the questions, Bob. Really cool. appreciate your uh, time today, and um, the information that you provided with provided us with is uh, incredible. And uh, I'm certainly uh, I'm better off for for the knowledge that uh, you imparted, uh, especially uh, as it relates to colorful natives in the landscape. Great, I had a great time. Thank you. And so um, this webinar uh, has been recorded, and it will be posted to the Dynascape website. My name is Joe Salemi. I'm the Product Marketing Manager. My contact information is on the screen. Uh, if you have any feedback or have any interest in telling us what kind of webinars you'd like to see in the future, um, that's my contact info there. Please feel free to get a hold of me. Thanks, everybody, and really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us.